Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to characterization of biomolecules using analytical ultracentrifugation. I'm Ross Verhuel of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences and I'll be moderating today's live event. I'd like to thank LabRoots for presenting today's webinar, which is brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, a global leader in centrifugation and life science instrumentation. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. I encourage you to participate by answering a few poll questions during the presentation and by submitting questions for our speaker at any time. To do so, simply type in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found on the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. With great pleasure, I now present today's speaker, my friend and colleague, Akash Bhattacharya of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Akash has extensive experience in various biophysical characterization methods, including analytical ultracentrifugation. Akash is currently a senior application scientist at Beckman with a focus on expanding and developing analytical ultracentrifugation applications. For Akash's complete bio, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Akash, Please go ahead and begin your presentation. Well, thank you, Ross. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this, which is the first of a three-part webinar brought to you by Beckman Coulter. The topic of this webinar is an introduction to the characterization of biomolecules using analytical ultracentrifugation, or AUC. Now, this technique, AUC, it's something that's been around for pretty much 90 years at this point and it's played a fundamental role in biology, chemistry, and material science. Uh, the very first research in AUC was done by Svedberg, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1926, and that was done also in the same time as Jean Perron, who received the Nobel Prize in Physics also in 1926 for his um, study of sedimentation equilibrium. And AUC has been an extremely powerful tool in biology and chemistry um, through all of these many years and has played a role in experiments, including, for example, uh, the meselson stahl experiment, which um, deals with DNA replication and has been frequently described as possibly the most elegant experiment in all of biology ever conducted. So we are really excited to bring you this webinar, particularly in the context of uh, the new Optima AUC instrument, which was introduced just two years ago by Beckman Coulter. This new instrument ushers in a new era of capability and extends its potential into previously unexplored sample areas. So with that being said, let's get started. This is a roadmap of our talk today. I'm going to spend the first part of the talk giving you an introduction to the technique. Then we'll talk about the actual operation of the AUC instrument, and the final part of the talk will delve into some application areas. So, the introduction to the technique of AUC. So when you're talking about biophysical techniques, there is always a trade-off between the different things that you want out of your technique of choice and what you get from your technique of choice. So you'd ideally want a technique which gives you substantial resolution and detail in the measurement process. At the same time, you want a technique which is relatively easy to use and hopefully not very expensive. And finally, you want a technique which also provides you flexibility and versatility. And I'm very happy to say that analytical ultracentrifugation is a technique which kind of sits in the sweet spot and offers you all of these different characteristics. So let's find out a little bit more about this technique. In a very small nutshell, what does AUC do? It separates analytes based upon size. Now at this point, I want to mention that through the rest of this webinar, I'll be using the word analyte and the word sample in a more or less interchangeable fashion. They mean the same thing. In a little bit more detail, AUC, it's really just a versatile technique to quantitatively characterize biological systems and other systems as well, and this is the most important part, 
in the solution phase. So what does AUC give you? It provides you with whole molecule or whole analyte thermodynamic parameters including, but not limited to, size, shape, the molecular mass of your system, the aggregation state of your system. If your system is forming a complex, then it also gives you information about the stoichiometry of the complex. And finally, if your system binds to any other biomolecule in solution, then analytical ultracentrifugation can also quantitatively define that binding by giving you a binding constant. And all of the calculations of analytical ultracentrifugation are based upon ab initio hydrodynamic theory. As a matter of fact, the fundamental physics of the process of analytical ultracentrifugation as it occurs in the experimental setup we use was described by Ole Lamb way back in 1929. However, the computational ability to solve the equation which he had described only became available in the 1990s, which led to a renaissance in the technique, which is something which has reached uh, what we'll call the new generation today. Okay, so with that being said, I would like to hand over control to my colleague Ross for a moment so that he can push out the first poll question. Ross? All right, thanks Akash. Our first poll question is to better understand our audience today. So what is your familiarity with AUC? Uh, and we'll give you about 15 seconds to go ahead and respond and then Akash will pick up. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So, I want to draw a line for you from ultracentrifugation, that is to say prep ultracentrifugation, because this is a technique which is going to be familiar to many members of our audience, especially those who are involved in cell biology or in virology. And the line is to be drawn from prep UC to analytical ultracentrifugation. So, if you consider that half of the effort of a biochemistry project of any kind is to purify products which are made by living cells, then what you're really trying to do is to separate the product of interest from the rest of the components of the cell. So, this is a process which is done by ultracentrifugation. So, what then is analytical ultracentrifugation? Very simply put, it is the method which characterizes the thing that you're trying to purify. And yes, the fundamental physics of analytical ultracentrifugation depends very much on the physics of ultracentrifugation. So, to give you a more concrete example of what I'm talking about, let us consider two different molecules of DNA. Or to be more specific, they are really the same molecule of DNA, as in the sequence is the same. However, one of those molecules of DNA is supercoiled and extremely compact, and the other molecule of DNA has been treated with a restriction enzyme. Therefore, it is nicked or it is linearized, and it is obviously no longer as compact as the other supercoiled version of the same molecule. So, if you use an ultracentrifugation experiment, then at the end of the experiment, your sample tube will have these clearly separated bands where one of the bands corresponds to the linearized or nicked DNA. The other band corresponds to the supercoiled DNA. Now, it's important to note why this happens. This separation occurs because one component or one analyte in this experiment clearly sediments to the bottom of the sample tube faster than the other component. This is something which occurs inside of a preparative ultracentrifuge. That is a beckman coulter product known as the Optima XPN, widely used in cell biology and in virology. And the quantity by which you measure how quickly one analyte sediments to the bottom of the cell is known as the sedimentation coefficient. And it is defined by something called the Svedberg equation, which I'm now going to put up over here, but I'm going to talk about in more detail very shortly. So again, drawing this line 
from preparative to analytical ultracentrifugation. What, what PREP UC does is that it separates analytes which sediment differently in the same tube, in the same buffer, in the same experiment. This is because of a simple fundamental principle of physics which states that objects which have densities which are different from that of the buffer medium will either sediment to the bottom of the sample tube or will float to the top of the sample tube over the course of an ultracentrifugation experiment. And what AUC does is that it monitors this movement of the analyte and processes that information to obtain the thermodynamic parameters that you, as a biophysicist or a biochemist, are interested in obtaining. And the instrument which does all of this is the Optima Analytical Ultracentrifuge brought to you by Beckman Coulter. Okay, so why would you choose AUC over the many other biophysical techniques which are commonly available? There are several really good reasons to do so. The first one is that AUC will characterize your biomolecules in the native state. There is no requirement for a substrate, a matrix, or a reporter molecule of any kind. And all of these different things add complications to your system of interest, which you would have to otherwise account for. In AUC experiments, you don't have to deal with these problems. The second advantage is that AUC experiments are non-destructive. Once the experiment is completed, you can always collect the sample and repurpose it for something else. And finally, information. AUC is a technique which gives you thermodynamic information greater than that which you can obtain via using a whole host of other techniques, including various light scattering, chromatography and spectroscopy, spectroscopy related techniques. So really what you should perhaps be thinking of is these different instruments which I have put on the screen over here such as DLS, SPR and what have you. All of these instruments provide information which is really preliminary information which you can then use to design an imaginative AUC experiment which will give you the thermodynamic parameters that you seek in the detail that you want. However, does it mean that AUC uh, is an infallible technique and does it have no limitations? That is not the case. AUC does have certain limitations and those are the following. What AUC provides to you is bulk thermodynamic parameters. Bulk is important here. What it cannot provide to you is the atomic level resolution which you would seek via either NMR spectroscopy or X-ray crystallography. And again, the second part of the first sentence, thermodynamic parameters. AUC provides you with equilibrium thermodynamic parameters, but it's not very good at providing you with a direct monitoring of reaction kinetics. That is, of course, something for which you would use a technique like stopped flow. However, being cognizant of these limitations, it is definitely possible to design imaginative AUC experiments which shed light upon your experiment, which on your system of interest, which no other technique can provide. Okay, so with that being said, let's move over to the forces in AUC and what they can tell you. So this is important in the context of what happens to your sample in an AUC experiment. So the AUC experiment is conducted inside what we call a sector-shaped cell or a sector cell. This is called a sector cell because if you take a horizontal cross-section of such a cell, then it literally looks like the sector of a circle, as is shown in the diagram over here. This sector of a circle spins around the axis demarcated by A at a very high speed and the part of the sector which is closest to this axis of rotation is um, the first part is what contains the air gap and there's nothing in there apart from air but the part of the sector cell which is radially outward from the air gap contains both buffer as well as analyte 
and the analyte shown here in the cyan circle moves radially outward from position X all the way to position Y which is at the very bottom of this sector cell and when it's it's moving radially outward shown by the direction of sedimentation arrow in red then the different forces which act upon it are shown as follows the centrifugal weight of this object it measures the mass of the analyte the buoyant force on the object measures the volume of the analyte and finally the frictional force on the object measures the shape of the object so these three different forces it's important to know how they the mathematics of their interaction because analyzing that essentially gives us the thermodynamic parameters which we seek so to summarize what I've been telling you so far what analytical ultra centrifugation does is that it takes a sample tube and spins it around the rotation axis really really fast and in doing so everything inside the sample tube is subjected to a very large centrifugal acceleration which is radially outward and as we do so the analytical ultra centrifuge brings to bear an arrangement of detector optics which observes what happens to a given analyte or sample over the course of the experiment in other words how it sediments to the bottom of the sample tube this process of how it sediments is really the information content of an AUC experiment and that is what we end up analyzing mathematically so with that being said we are done with the introductory part of this talk and it's time to move over to the operational aspect of analytical ultra simplification so let's get started this is a very quick tour of the AUC hardware the Optima AUC comes with a couple of different types of rotors you can get either a four hole rotor or an eight hole rotor the four hole rotor will spin up to 60,000 rpm the eight hole rotor will go up to 50,000 rpm so depending on whether your system of interest requires high throughput or whether it requires higher speeds you make the choice of rotor depending on that the loading of sample into the cell is very simple it is shown here in this picture well I, where you can see that sample is being loaded via a narrow stem pipette tip and what you can also see is the actual sector shape of the cell where the sample is being loaded once you've loaded up sample getting the detector modules aligned into position is as simple as turning a couple of knobs and then you're good to go with starting your experiment up all right so now that we've got uh, the experiment going let's take a look at what the detection apparatus looks like so there are two different types of optical arrangements available to you interference optics and absorption multi-wavelength optics we will be discussing these in more detail in subsequent webinars but for the purposes of today's introductory webinar what matters is that we'll treat the optic systems in the same way there's a light source which sends a beam of light via a few mirrors through a cell which is inside a rotor and the rotor itself is of course spinning and then the light comes out from the bottom of the cell and impinges upon a detector system so the data that is acquired is sample concentration on the y-axis versus radial distance from the axis of rotation this radial distance is the x-axis parameter and this data is recorded repeatedly over the time course of the experiment and that is what you end up analyzing mathematically so let's look at how we make the transition from sample to data so there's a lot going on at this slide let's unpack this slowly on the top right you have a view of what a sector cell looks like a given cell housing contains two sectors the left side sector is usually where you put your buffer and the right side sector is where you would put your sample and you'll notice that moving radially outwards from the axis of rotation there are three distinct regions inside the sample sector 
The first region shown in red shading is the air gap. And it's fairly obvious that all that's present in that region is just air. The second region shown in cyan shading is, is where you've got buffer, but you've got no sample. So if you look at both the first region, the air gap, as well as the second region where there's buffer but no sample, and then you compare it with the figure down below, you'll notice that both of these regions correspond to essentially zero absorbance. In other words, there's really nothing which would give you a signal. But the last region moving radially outwards, shown in dark blue, is where you've actually got sample. And that sample plus buffer is where the signal plateaus out at approximately 0.5 absorbance units. Now, the real interesting thing is the transition from the cyan region, where you've got buffer but no sample, to the blue region, where you've got buffer and sample. This transition involves what we call the meniscus. And over the time course of the experiment, as the sediment, uh, as the analyte sediments towards the bottom of the sample tube, this meniscus or this boundary moves further and further to the right. And it is in fact the movement of this boundary which is so information rich in terms of actual experimental data. And that is really what we try to analyze to obtain our thermodynamic parameters. So if you look at what happens to a plot of sample concentration or really absorbance versus radial distance from the beginning to the end of an experiment. It starts out as a complete plateau and then a meniscus is formed as we start the system spinning and as the system spins and spins and the sample sediments, the meniscus moves further and further to the right as all of the sample is pelleting towards the bottom of the tube. Okay. So I had briefly spoken about the Svedberg equation earlier, but now let's look at the Svedberg equation in all of its complete mathematical glory, and here it is. The sedimentation coefficient S of an analyte, which measures how fast it sediments, it has a very specific definition. It is defined as the velocity of the analyte per unit centrifugal acceleration. However, there are a couple of intuitive insights which I want you to take away from this equation, and they are the following. In any AUC experiment, a heavier object will sediment faster than a lighter one. That's the first insight. The second one, in any AUC experiment, a denser object will sediment faster than a less dense object. As a case example, think of tiny iron nanospheres versus polystyrene nanospheres. The iron nanospheres will sediment faster. And again, in any AUC experiment, an isotropic object will sediment faster than an anisotropic object or a spread out object. Um, to give you an example, which we've already looked at, a supercoiled DNA molecule will sediment faster than a linearized DNA molecule. Okay, so now that we have an intuitive understanding of what the parameter called sedimentation coefficient means to us, let us look at the different types of experiments which people like to use in an AUC workflow. So the different types of experiments are really sedimentation equilibrium and sedimentation velocity. And your choice of which experiment you want to use essentially depends on what you seek in terms of information content from that experiment. If you want the most accurate possible calculation of molecular weight and binding constant in an experiment, then you'll probably want to go for sedimentation equilibrium, which is a long experiment run at relatively low speeds and uses this six sector centerpiece shown at the bottom of the column. However, Sedimentation equilibrium does not give you an estimation of the shape of the molecule of interest. If you also want to determine the shape of the molecule of interest, then you would opt for sedimentation velocity, and that is an experiment which is run at significantly higher speeds, but for a shorter duration of time, just a few hours, 
and typically uses this two sector centerpiece as shown at the bottom of the right side column. Okay, so now that we are done with uh, the operational aspect of analytical ultra centrifugation, it is time to start talking about the applications of this amazing technique. So, AUC is a technique which plays a very important role in both the discovery and research phase of uh, pharmaceutical work as well as the quality control phase of pharmaceutical work. So let's first talk about the strengths that AUC can bring to um, the discovery part of pharma. And let's talk about a few typical systems which you might encounter. So if you're looking at proteins and nucleic acids or any combination thereof, and the question that you're asking is related to high resolution structure, then the technique of choice is going to be X-ray crystallography and a mass spectroscopy, or sometimes cryo-electron microscopy. However, if your question is related to dynamics, allosteric movement, or really what I like to call the shape-shifting of biomolecules, then yes, you could use NMR spectroscopy or small angle X-ray scattering, but you run into a problem of cost. NMR spectroscopy requires isotope label samples. Small angle X-ray scattering is usually conducted at synchrotron beam lines, and you'll have to travel halfway across the continent to get to one. Analytical ultracentrifugation, AUC on the other hand, does not require such expensive isotope label samples and is a technique which you can have in-house in the lab, literally down the corridor. So it's both simple as well as inexpensive. Now, if you want to determine the mass of a biomolecular system, then the most accurate technique that you can probably seek is mass spectrometry. However, mass spectrometry suffers from a severe problem of dynamic range it is very limited in the maximum size of the systems that it can look at. Analytical ultracentrifugation, on the other hand, can look at systems which range in size from, say, a dinucleotide all the way up to intact viruses. The dynamic range of AUC is enormous. And finally, if you're trying to answer questions related to interactions, if you're trying to find binding constants and stoichiometry of a given reaction, then yes, you do have access to a whole range of techniques, including surface plasma resonance, light scattering, calorimetry, fluorescence, and so on and so forth. But every one of these techniques is ultimately limited in either its dynamic range or in its requirements for some kind of a label or reporter molecule or in its requirements for some kind of a matrix or substrate. AUC is a technique which does not require a label. It does not require a reporter molecule. It has enormous dynamic range, and it analyzes the system in its native state, not requiring any kind of substrate or matrix. These are some of the strengths which AUC brings to the discovery part of pharma research, and which is why it has been such a popular technique over the years. Now let's look at what AUC brings to quality control. System of interest is a viral capsid or a liposome, an exosome, any kind of drug carrier vehicle, then the typical question that quality control asks is, is this drug carrier vehicle actually loaded with the cargo of interest or is it empty? And in this context, people have sometimes used techniques such as transmission electron microscopy. However, TEM suffers from the dual problem of being firstly very expensive and having a fairly non-trivial sample preparation problem. AUC, on the other hand, is far cheaper, is a technique which you can have in-house you can literally run down the corridor and run experiments on the AUC instrument next door. And it provides you with a single point quality control metric, which tells you whether your prep is empty or whether it is fully loaded with the therapeutic cargo of interest. It can also tell you 
whether there is free cargo floating around in your formulation buffer, which is also really important in the QC context. If your work is on biologics or biosimilars or antibodies, then uh, the, uh, the statement which is frequently made about biologics is that the product is the process. So ideally, you want to end up with a product which is as pure as possible. And you want to know in a given batch, what is the fraction of the pure protein versus aggregated protein? And the technique which is commonly used is size exclusion chromatography. However, AUC provides you with a better dynamic range, a better ability to identify contaminants, and yes, measurement in the native state. AUC does not require any kind of a matrix with size exclusion chromatography columns absolutely do. And finally, if you're looking at labeled antibodies and you want to determine the labeling efficiency of your preparation process, then AUC can quantify the labeling efficiency and again identify whether you've got free label in the formulation buffer. So these are just some of the strengths that AUC brings to both the discovery part of pharmaceutical work as well as the quality control part of pharmaceutical work. And let's take a quick break while Ross gets the next poll question out to you. Ross? All right, thanks, Akash. So our second question is regarding your needs when considering various characterization techniques. And so we'd like to ask, in your most important characterization step, what is most critical to your process? Again, we'll give you about 15 seconds, and then Akash will continue on with the rest of the presentation. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the talk. So we've discussed the utility of AUC in both discovery as well as in quality control. So let's look at some actual case examples. So AUC finds a role in looking at biologics, biosimilars, antibodies, vesicles, and gene therapy. So here's the first one. Let's look at what AUC does in the biologics context. And I'm going to bring to you the standard quality control question, which is what percentage of my sample prep is a functional monomer and what percentage has aggregated? Of course, this question will be modified on de depending on whether the functional state of your biologic is a monomer or a dimer. But this is the essential import of the question. What part of my sample is functional and what part has aggregated. So AUC can provide information to answer this question down to single digit percentage accuracy. And if there has been some unexpected behavior during the drug purification process, which causes the appearance of an unwanted multimer state, then AUC can quantify this behavior, which will allow you to go back and troubleshoot the biochem steps involved in the preparation. And the example I want to show you comes from my favorite biologic, which is insulin. And this is an example which we will be dealing as a detailed case study in a subsequent webinar, where we will go through the workflow steps. But right now, what I want to show to you is the end result of the workflow steps. So what you end up with once you've run the experiment, process the entire data mathematically, is a plot of signal concentration versus molecular weight. And if you look at this in detail, you will see that this example gives you 93.8% of this sample is present as a dimer, and about 5.8% of the sample is present as a hexamer, and the rest of this is basically trace oligomers. <laughs> 
So this really is the kind of information content which you can get out of AUC for every single batch of your biologic prep. However, AUC brings certain strengths to the table which other techniques used in this context, especially size exclusion chromatography, do not. And a good example of this is, uh, comes from this study which was published in Sci Reports about three years ago. So the researchers were working on a few different antibody samples, and they were trying to characterize these antibodies using size exclusion chromatography. And that technique worked for the antibody called MEDI578, which is shown in the trace in red on the left side panel and comes up as a very sharp peak in uh, the ACC experiment. However, when they tried to characterize the second antibody, which was MEDI912, which is shown in the blue colored trace on the left side panel, they, sh they ended up with this hideous, broad, and asymmetrical peak. And of course, this happens because certain antibodies will interact with the material that the SEC column is made out of, or its matrix. And if it does so, then it cannot be characterized by SEC at all. However, AUC does not suffer from this problem. You will remember that AUC analyzes samples in their native state. And when the researchers took this antibody MEDI912 and subjected it to an AUC experiment, they were able to find that it has a small percentage of monomer, a much larger percentage of dimer, and then a small um, trace amounts of higher order structures and aggregates. And this kind of resolution is only available because AUC treats this sample and looks at it in its native state and does not require any kind of an interaction with a matrix which SEC does. And therefore, AUC clearly gives you information that size exclusion chromatography fails to do so. OK, so the next type of example we'll be looking at comes from the world of vesicles. So a vesicle, what is a vesicle? It's really nothing but a drug carrier vehicle, a suitcase, if you will, except that the suitcase is made up of lipid bilayers. And the contents of that suitcase are really what we are interested in. The contents of that suitcase are going to be the therapeutic cargo that we want to load in it, specifically the drug of interest. So the question that is therefore going to be asked is, what percentage of my vesicle prep is intact and how many, what percentage of my vesicle prep has broken down? And then can I distinguish between an intact but empty vesicle versus a intact and drug loaded vesicle? And AUC can absolutely answer both questions. So let's look at an example of that. So this is an experiment which we conducted, and let's work you through what's on screen. The blue trace on the left is data recorded at 230 nanometers, which is where we can observe vesicles. And this shows you empty control liposomes, and they sediment at a value of S equals 100. Now, if we take the same vesicles, and by same I mean the exact same size, however, these are loaded with a therapeutic cargo, a drug, then you get the red trace also recorded at the same absorption wavelength of 230 nanometers. But now you will notice that the red trace with the drug loaded liposomes has shifted to the right and its sediments at the much larger value of S equals 250. This is, of course, because the drug loaded liposome has a much higher density than the empty or control liposomes, although it has the same radius. And remember what I had mentioned about an intuitive understanding of the Swedberg equation, denser objects sediment faster. This is a denser object, has a higher S value, and will sediment faster. But really, the most interesting part of this experiment comes from the green trace. This green trace was recorded from data obtained at absorption at 490 nanometers. 490 nanometers is an interesting wavelength. This is the wavelength at which the drug molecule itself absorbs. And I was able to do this in the same experiment because the brand new Optima AUC ins instrument manufactured by Beckman Coulter has multi-wavelength capability. So I can actually look at different wavelengths over the course of the same experiment. 
and I was monitoring what happens to the drug itself. Turns out that the drug sediments at the same S value as that of the loaded liposome, which is very interesting because what it tells us is that it, it's, it's basically all encapsulated inside of the loaded liposome and there is almost no free drug floating around in the formulation buffer. So this is a great example of what AUC can bring to the table for um, looking at drug-loaded vesicles. It can offer you baseline separation of an empty vesicle versus a drug-loaded vesicle. And it can also assess whether there is any free drug floating around in the formulation buffer or not. In this case, I was very impressed with the quality control of the product that I was looking at. OK, so now that we've looked at vesicles, let's spend a moment to talk about gene therapy. So gene therapy. What is gene therapy? The basic idea behind this is that we are trying to introduce some kind of a therapeutic gene into the host DNA, which will thereafter make proteins and cure some kind of biological condition. So what you really need, the essential part of the preceding sentence, is introduce a host, uh, introduce a therapeutic gene. And for that, what you need is a delivery vehicle. And the delivery vehicle of choice for a lot of gene therapy projects is adeno-associated virus. So what is adeno-associated virus? It's basically a viral capsid which comes with a large intrinsic genome. And that intrinsic genome can be modified to carry a therapeutic cargo, at which point it's basically a transgenic cargo. So the question that we are really trying to ask is the following. What percentage of my viral capsids in this prep that I'm looking at are intact, and how many of them have broken down? The second question is, can I distinguish between an intact but empty viral capsid, which only has the outer protein coat, but does not have the transgenic cargo inside, and, an, and, a, and a viral capsid which actually contains the transgenic cargo? And finally, can I say anything about partially loaded viral capsids? So AUC can absolutely answer questions one and two. And we are working on developing methodologies to address question number three, which is partially loaded viral capsids. And it's worthwhile also noting that this is very important in the modern pharma context, especially in the light of recent guidelines which have come to us from the FDA, where they say that viral particles that do not contain the therapeutic gene are unlikely to have therapeutic activity. However, these particles themselves might produce adverse reactions such as an allergic response. So in the light of these guidelines, it's very important to assess the quality or the purity of a given viral PrEP. And if you do an AUC experiment on such a viral PrEP, then you will end up with a population distribution of sedimentation coefficients, which look like this. So let's look at what's going on over here. Empty capsids, which are shown uh, on the left side of the trace within the vertical black bars, sediment at about 60 to 65 S. And they are almost baseline separated from partially loaded and fully loaded capsids, which are shown on the right. As it turns out, partially loaded capsids will sediment at around 90 to 95 S, and fully loaded capsids will sediment at around 105 to 110 S. So what you need to quantify whether your viral prep has been successful or not is ideally a single point, a single number QC metric. And the way to obtain that is to simply integrate the signal between the two vertical bars as shown, and to divide that by the total signal in your experiment. The number you end up getting will be the percentage empty. The lower this number, obviously, the better the quality of your prep. So Optima AUC data can therefore provide a single point QC metric, which will tell you the quality of a given viral prep that you've made. And we are working 
on developing methodologies to better quantify the region I have marked out in the red circle, which is to say partial loads. And this brings us to the end of the applications that I wanted to cover. And uh, please remember that we will be reaching out to you uh, after this webinar and ask you about the other application systems that you would like us to cover in subsequent webinars. And you will have an opportunity to provide feedback on that. But this also is the end of today's talk. So I wanted to thank all of you for your attention. And we will be pushing a poll question out momentarily. But before we do so, let's take a moment to also look at forthcoming AUC events. So we will have two more webinars in this calendar year in which we'll be talking about the theoretical underpinnings of AUC. We'll be going into experimental setup in much more detail. And yes, we will be talking about case examples ranging from protein aggregation to binding equilibria to viral capsids again, as well as other kind of vesicles, not just liposomes. And here we will solicit feedback from you. And if there is a system which you are particularly interested in and you believe that others would also want to learn about, then we, we might talk about that as well. We'll also give you an overview of the different analysis packages which are out there. And finally, we will spend some time talking about advanced analysis, looking at noise and sources of error, how to account for them, and how they affect your experimental results. The annual AUC conference this year is going to be held in Christchurch, New Zealand in about two months' time. Registration is open at this point. Please sign up. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and your attention. And I'll give control over to Ross so that he can push the poll question out. And then we'll take questions from you. Thank you very much. Ross, over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Akash, for a great presentation. Uh, as we move into the Q&A portion of the webinar, we'll push out one final poll question um, asking you uh, what you got out of this uh, webinar and what your thoughts are on AUC. Um, as a reminder, you can submit questions by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And with that, we'll get started with the first question. So Akash, what is the process for data collection and analysis? All right, Ross, thank you. So the process for data collection and analysis. OK, so this is a two-part question. Let's break this up. The way the experiment is set up is from your browser. The actual AUC instrument is controlled by an onboard computer. The way you communicate with that AUC instrument is via your laptop using Firefox or Safari or Chrome or whatever browser you want to. So you don't need to install any specific or custom software to control the instrument. Once the experiment is completed, then you can download the data from the Optima AUC also directly from the browser onto your laptop. And once that data has been downloaded in zip format, then you can unpack it, and then you can use a number of different software packages to analyze the data. The user community has developed several such software packages. Two packages which are very commonly used and are quite popular are SedFit and Ultrascan. And we will be giving you a brief overview of these packages in subsequent webinars. All right, thanks, Akash. Uh, the next question is, if I have a sample to run, how do I choose the run parameters, and where would I go to find information to get started? OK, excellent question. So if you have a sample to run, depending on what kind of sample it is, uh, there are several pre-experiment input parameters which you will try to find. Some of these parameters are fairly easy. For example, if you're dealing with a protein sample, you know what the average density of most proteins are like. If you're dealing with a nucleic acid sample, again, you know what the average density of most nucleic acid samples are like. Uh, the different user community-based um, uh, analysis packages that I had mentioned, Ultrascan and SedFit, they actually have very useful simulation modules built into uh, the systems where you can plug in the estimated parameters of your system of interest, such as estimated molecular weight, whether it associates, uh, what is its density, so on and so forth. And they can actually generate a suggested 
uh, rotation speed for the rotor for you. In fact, they can, they can generate suggested experiment protocols for you at this point. All right, thank you, Akash. Um, the next question we have is, what is AUC's throughput and how many samples might I be able to run in a day? Okay, so let's work that through. If you're using an eight-hole rotor, then you have to uh, account for one of the sector, one of the holes is a counterbalance, which has to be there. So you can do seven samples at one go. And if you're doing a sedimentation velocity experiment, you can probably do an experiment in six hours or thereabouts. So really, you're looking at uh, perhaps 14 samples in a workday. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is, I have a Proteum lab, and what kind of operating system do I need to run on the new Optima AUC, and how does this differ from my current setup? Okay, so um, again, very good question. Uh, whatever operating system you like. The reason is that um, the control of the Optima AUC is via browser. The system has an onboard computer which you don't need to worry about because that is something which is maintained via software upgrades that we'll provide. In order for con setting up an experiment and downloading the data, you can use whatever operating system that you have on your laptop. And as long as you're able to uh, set it up on the same network, you just connect to the instrument via browser and download data via browser. It is basically platform agnostic. All right, great. The next question is asking, what is the purpose of the air gap in the sample sector? Well, you don't, um, you want to have a small amount of air gap because you don't want, and you will end up having a small amount of air gap because you don't want to load sample all the way because you simply want to balance things properly. Uh, however, you also want to keep the length of the air gap as small as possible because the quality of your data and the resolution of your experiment will depend to a certain extent upon the length of the sample column. So if your air gap is huge and occupies half of the length of the sample column, then you're basically throwing away data which you should have. All right, thank you. The next question is, what sort of information can we see with nanoparticles? What sort of information can we see with nanoparticles? An experiment with nanoparticles should typically give you a distribution of popul a population distribution of size and molecular weight. And if you're seeing aggregation, then AUC should also be able to quantify that aggregation. And um, if you're also seeing the appearance of aggregates which have some kind of unusual anisotropic uh, property, then that, uh, that anisotropy or that distortion of shape is also something which you should be able to obtain via an AUC experiment. Okay. The next question is, are there any application areas for AUC with vaccines? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, AUC is basically something which can uh, determine whether a given uh, prep of any kind of biological system is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So therefore, if you are interested in quantifying or, or doing some kind of QC work on any biological system, including, for example, deactivated viruses, and you just want a PrEP which is as homogeneous as possible, then yes, AUC can answer that question. It can tell you whether your PrEP is homogeneous or whether you're dealing with a very heterogeneous mix of things, um, deactivated viruses, broken up viral capsids, uh, just free protein fragments floating around in your formulation buffer. It can tell you whether you have all of these things or not. Okay, great. The next one is asking if it is possible to use AC to get analysis of plastic polymers. Uh, yes, it is. It's, um, I have actually done some experiments recently on plastic polymers, and depending on uh, 
depending on the, let's say, the oligomerization behavior of these polymers, your experiments can give you very high resolution information or they can give you a very broad distribution of uh, sedimentation coefficients, which again will tell you that the polymer that you're looking at is actually quite heterogeneous in terms of um, its distribution of monomeric units. Okay, next up is a question about the optics asking if 280 nanometer light is available. Yes, sir. 280 nanometer UV absorbance is the standard wavelength which we look at for uh, looking at proteins because that is, of course, where the side chains will absorb. Uh, it's also possible to look at 230 nanometers, which is where the peptide bond will absorb if you're looking at smaller concentration protein samples. And it's possible to do that in the same experiment because the Optima AUC, as I've mentioned, is an amazing instrument which brings to you multi-wavelength capabilities. Okay, excellent. Um, the next question is asking, uh, what sort of interferences might there be with uh, lipids in the separation that you're using for AC? I'm, I'm sorry, can you please repeat that question, please? Yeah, of course. It's asking, what sort of interferences do you get with lipids in your separation? Okay, so that is, um, that's actually a fairly complicated question. So, so let's let's try to break this down. Is the lipid the analyte that you're trying to look at, or is the lipid uh, just something which exists in the buffer but is not actually the analyte? These are two different things. Uh, obviously, if you're looking at lip as lipids as the analyte, then yes, you can quantify what's going on. And after all, the liposome is essentially nothing but a construct which is made up of lipids, right? So yes, you can look at lipids in an AUC experiment. However, if the lipid is not the analyte, but it is something which is present in the formulation buffer, then that is something that you will have to account for mathematically while doing the analysis. What it will end up doing is that it will end up changing the effective density of the buffer, and that has to be somehow mathematically accounted for, um, but it can be done. Okay, next question is, why would I choose certain centerpiece compositions over the other? So looking at epoxy aluminum. Okay, excellent question. So the epoxy or epon centerpieces are rated to go up to 45,000 RPM. The aluminum centerpieces are rated to go up to 60,000 RPM. So if you're looking at some kind of a system which is quite small, and therefore you have to run at a much higher speed in order to see its sediment properly, then you would probably want to use the aluminum centerpiece simply because it goes up to a higher speed. Uh, of course, uh, you would want to check the chemical compatibility of your system with the aluminum centerpiece before you proceed with such an experiment. Okay, great. Uh, given the amount of time, I think we have a question or time for one more question. Uh, asking what volume and titer is required for doing AUC analysis of AAVs? Okay, so um, the volume of an AUC uh, sample is going to be around 450 microliters, give or take a little bit. And what is the titer? The best way to answer that question is to take a little bit of your sample and put it on a nanodrop or whatever other UV uh, spec that you have. And if you're looking at 230 nanometers, which is what we would prefer to look at, then you need to have absorption values of between 0.1 to 1 units on a 10 millimeter path length. That is the amount of sample that you would like to have. All right, thank you, Akash. Do you have any final comments for our audience regarding AUC before we close things up? Yeah, sure. So AUC is an amazing technique. It is really a Swiss army knife of biophysics and the limitations of what you can do with AUC are honestly only limited by your imagination. So reach out to us, tell us what kind of, kind of sample systems you would like us to talk about in subsequent webinars, and we'll get back to you and we'll try to address those systems. Thank you very much for your time and your attention, and uh, we hope to hear from you shortly. Thank you. All right, Akash, thank you again for taking the time to discuss the opportunities of AUC. I'd like to also thank Laboratory and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences.
Before we go, I'd like to finally thank the audience for joining us today and participating. For any questions we didn't have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period, we'll, we will address those uh, by the speaker via contact information provided when you registered. When the webinar recording is available for replay, you will receive an email from Labberts, and I encourage you to share that recording with any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. I hope to see you again at the next AUC webinar, and until then, goodbye.